We're standing in West Toronto, <laughs> near Dundas and Bloor, near a very old looking footbridge going over a railroad. And I'm standing with Jack Butler, who has a special relationship with this bridge. Uh, and I found it really fascinating. Uh, hi, Jack. <laughs> How are you doing, Chris? <laughs> Good, thanks. Yeah, welcome to Dundas West <laughs> Rail Path. It's, uh, yeah. it's nice to be here. I, I've heard nothing about it, so it's finally nice to meet it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you have a special story, uh, and I think it's a really great introduction, uh, in a way, a, a legend, if you will, of your work and, and methodology, it being so um, pioneering in, in human physical manifestations of the psyche. <laughs> wow. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the formal and... Uh, uh, approach you take to to a lot of what is a sort of a, a fuzzy condition of, of human nature and it, uh, hopefully i haven't uh, which fuzzy condition did you have in mind <laughs> <laughs> the emotional baggage we carry i see uh, thank you yeah and uh, so if you if you'd like to sort of talk about how you you first discovered this bridge and discovered a little bit more about about yourself yeah i this was about a year and two months ago I had uh, walked over from where I live in Dundas West, near Dundas West, to DuPont Avenue to the guy who does all my scanning for, for imagery. And I took the Dundas West Street, and I decided there's a shortcut on the way back that would cross this bridge, which I'd only seen, I'd never been on it. So I came the back route and got to this point under the Wallace side of the bridge. You know, and decided to just go up the bridge and cross Dundas Street because it's the only thing around for many, many blocks before you get to the Blue Street Bridge itself. And I got to the first level, which is about a story and a half, and I, I couldn't go any farther. My fear of heights just absolutely took over. I just was truly paralyzed with this, which was both embarrassing and inconvenient. I came back down to the beginning. I tried it again, and I realized because you can see through the steps basically step by step and it is so high that I really couldn't do it so I continued on the rail path which is designed for cyclists and walkers all the way down which is another 20 blocks till you get to Bloor Street proper and then I could go up to Bloor and go home from there but I became really concerned this seemed ridiculous at this point in my life that I couldn't cross this bloody bridge. And have you run into any anything like this before with this particular phobia? Yeah I've always been afraid of heights didn't, didn't. And why this was relevant at the moment is, I was scheduled at that point to have an, an MRI for what's called a frozen shoulder, but a disabled shoulder. And I had done an MRI about 10 years ago in regard to my neck, and I knew that the experience of being in the closed space was so claustrophobic. They, they give you a little button to push in case you're in terror. Right. You know, and I found when I the, the table slid back into it, I kept my eyes closed. I went into deep meditation. I could feel my breath right on the roof of this, right before the front of my nose. It was all I could do to suppress a kind of panic. I thought I'd been in meditation for maybe 10 minutes. It turns out it was closer to 40 minutes. So that was quite successful. But facing the idea that I was gonna do one, possibly three, it occurred to me that the connection between my fear of heights and the fear of enclosed spaces, claustrophobia, both come from a trigger like that I located the base of the brain. It's as, it's as ancient as human beings, but it is a condition trigger. It probably goes back to my own childhood experiences. So I decided if I could do the bridge, I could probably do the MRI with some, some peace and not face this you know, with terror. And so I started the following day to, to the other side of the bridge to go back to the bridge and walk two or three more steps every day <laughs> higher <laughs> I literally trained myself in two weeks to cross the bridge. And to cross the bridge with not only impunity, but with pleasure, because it's a magnificent view of the rail tracks you saw as we were coming across. It's a very special part of the landscape. And so then I discovered that there's this Toronto West rail path on the Wallace side of the bridge. And so I started taking the morning, the morning walk. I was generally up about 5.30 or 6. I talked to a friend at 6. I'm ready for work about 7. And so I would come out very early this time of year and walk the whole rail path, which was just a beautiful way to start the day and cross the bridge going over and cross the bridge going back. And then late in May, early in June, I had the first of the MRIs and it didn't fucking phase me. <laughs> <laughs> it was really my reconditioning 
my older daughter is a psychologist at this point in her life, academic psychologist, and she said it's classic reconditioning, Dad. You know, what you did is what we do, you know, step by step, person by person, to get over these kind of irrational phobias. It's only irrational because it doesn't suit life, but it has a history that's totally valid. And it began to take me back to my considerations of my own childhood sources in relation to being able to cross the bridge, being able to face the claustrophobia of the MRI, and how I would think about this disabled shoulder I have from the inside. My kind of approach toward accepting and understanding what's actually happening in my body could be done the same way I did the bridge and the MRI. And that's how the series of drawings, that actually I presented 25 new drawings at the Subtle Technology Conference this year as a case study of trying to heal my MRI, trying to heal my disabled shoulder. So where would you like to go with it from there? <laughs> <laughs> That's my introduction. So are you, um, you said an academic psychologist. Is this the same thing as a cognitive scientist? Is this believing the rewiring, the plasticity of the brain, and rewiring the, the neurons by physical uh, leveraging? Well, I'm, I'm very much interested in all those ideas, and I have read the material about the plasticity of the brain, and that probably is part of what gave me the kind of the idea that I could probably do this. But that it would be connected as well to another phobia. That it would be connected to another phobia, that they might have a similar kind of source. And I'd be, now that I can do the bridge, which I do all the time, and I really enjoy it, and I don't want to keep doing MRIs because I, that I enjoy that, no, but no. I certainly could do it successfully. Uh, Emily's work has to do with, with psychology of language, but she's you know, well versed in basic human responses, and so the, my, uh, my pulse rate, my blood pressure, uh, these things are all now adjusted to deal with the situation so it doesn't create a sense of panic, but my body responds by putting me into a different state that I can deal with this, and I'm carrying that into the drawings, including drawings of the bridge, it's become one of my favorite topics here. <laughs> so is this, um, has this had a ripple effect in other places besides the MRI and, and crossing this bridge? Have you been in other potentially phobic situations that uh, has been since? No, no, I, the, the, uh, I haven't exercised my anti-phobia <laughs> procedures <laughs> yet. But what I have done is value my own internal voice, however fragile, tentative, inconclusive, irrational, uh, as a means of understanding what's happening with the disability in my shoulder, which is not being solved by over two years with mechanical means, though as my various therapists tell me, it hasn't gotten worse, for which I should be thankful, Jack, right. and I am. But uh, in one of the newest drawings, the one based on Blake's Nine Circles of Hell, the very top level, I ended up doing a, a set of meditations on my shoulder, which produced six images that are all nested in that ninth circle, each of which is starting a whole sequence of works. So that in one sense, it comes out of the same situation. But what I've learned in the process is to kind of value much more consciously. And in my presentation to Subtle Technology this year, I called it a case study using radiological imaging and um, drawing a technology of the hand as maps to understand my own condition by valuing my inner voice, which is, you know, tentative, fragmented, inconclusive. And these things, these are qualities I'm now valuing in the drawings. And because I work small and I work directly and I do a lot of drawing, I can try all kinds of things and it doesn't have to be, you know, I don't have to conclude that it's art. I can conclude that it's an artistic process and that's satisfying enough. I was told in art school, this is simplifying things a bit, um, <clears throat> that for artists, it's important to be uncomfortable. Uncomfortable? Uncomfortable. Uh, to be in places that aren't familiar is what helps spark creativity. If you're too comfortable, it, it doesn't help. Uh, as opposed to, say, the, the typical cliche for write, you know, writer's advice is to write what you know. It seems to be artist is to explore what you don't know or, or explore what makes you uncomfortable. Um, what are you doing right now? What is your motive in doing this? Is this an art of some kind? <laughs> yes, yes it is. Are you uncomfortable? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, it, it's, it's hard to, to be able to focus to listen well enough. Yeah. Um, 
to... I do expect you to pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> but You were a student when I was teaching years ago. At, as a matter of fact, at the Alberta College of Art, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. And even though I never met you or directly saw your work, I heard enough about you that it definitely did have an influence. So this, this is definitely a, a thrill. And... Um, based on hearsay. <laughs> based, based purely on hearsay, but the fact that your concepts can translate, you know, uh, through the virus of spoken language, uh, has to be good. Yeah, <laughs> you know? it is good. I, I spent this last Saturday working on, I, I often start new projects, or what, what I think what I'm doing is going to be new for me, in my little notebook, and they're very tiny little moleskin notebooks with pretty good quality paper, and, uh, I was working on self-portraits, quite literally, from iPhone photographs uh, that I had taken you know, of, of, of myself. And a friend, my friend John, did a whole bunch at Starbucks one day. I said, John, I need to know what I, as a source for these. I'm not entirely sure why. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with it. I've done a whole series of portraits of overlapping faces that represent me, but they're not of me. And I wanted to do ones of me. And I did three three-hour sessions in this little notebook. I was really into it. And so I wouldn't say that it was uncomfortable, but it was a truly humbling experience because at the end of the day, and none of them look like me to me. I'm totally lost in at sea and trying to do these drawings, and yet there are about 12 of them, you know, and I work on them. I was looking at them again this morning. I'm going to go back to them. I'm allowed to go back and work over them. So in terms of judging the value of work in terms of the degree of discomfort, I don't think it's a very good index. But really working, I find, uh, I wouldn't even say it's uncomfortable. I get so far into it, it's its own experience. But I, I think of it as a humbling experience. At the end of the day, whatever made me think I could be an artist is completely ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and da Vinci's version of the spinal column looks like the bridge <laughs> to me. And this. That's, that's Gray's Anatomy, that's the nervous supply. And it's going towards, of course, the shoulder. It's going from the shoulder down to the hand, yeah. Is it okay if I flip? Uh, <laughs> maybe not. Okay. Yeah. Light on. Here's, here's an interesting example of the kind of self-portraits I was doing that are not of me. Can you read the two faces, the one over the other? Yes. And this is what I was trying to work toward, the kind of sense of interior dialogue. You know, a conversation with oneself. This is the first one. Actually, this came from the big drawing back there called the Nine Circles of Hell. And this is the image from the top that represents the house I grew in from the time I was about three years old. And there's a ghost of a figure behind the house with the raised shoulder. And it was suggesting those steps that made me think, aha, uh -huh, you know. <laughs> to, then to the bridge. No, those are self portraits. Oh, here's the one. Here's the one over the bridge. Oh, and that's looking like the Da Vinci's. And there's the Da Vinci's. And the, yeah. and the shoulder. See the shoulder within it? Yes. I'm going to do more with that. And this one then, the, the Dundas West Bridge, the upside. And then several, like bodies of different ages ending up with a childlike face at the top of this. But it was from there I decided that I, to go ahead and do the larger drawings over here. I don't want to get enough light on them over there. Okay. Yep. Great. The first one on the extreme left was the much more careful drawing on paper that represents my skin as what I had in mind. These are like drawn on the body. And so it's a fuller drawing of the child becoming the adult with the frozen arm superimposed on the steps, then I, I began to think, I don't need the drawing, the literal drawing of the figures. The paper itself is my body. What I need is the steps themselves. They carry the whole message, which broadens the audience, for one thing. You know, and it makes a different kind of art project, with the delicate lines describing the bridge, sort of submerged in the texture of the, t of, of the skin. And then the, those are both the up steps. <laughs> This is going up the steps on the Wallace side that we just did, underneath which we did the interview. <laughs> this is going up the steps on the Dundas side in the first approach. So this is the bridge going across. Here, it's that way. 
And then this is on the Wallace side going down, and there's little cars, and there's Wallace Avenue. <laughs> that one I like just all by itself, and there's enough of a drawing of the sort of body echoing, sort of swimming across the space, plus its color. And here's the first of the steps toward Da Vinci, and that's a it's not where it's going to end, but I'm stuck there. That's, that's very foul. It, it's so foul, like, isn't it incredible? Yes. Once I drew it, I saw that. And then I went back to look at the, does the Da Vinci look like that? I'll take a look and see what you think. Oh, that sneaky Da Vinci. He didn't know either how much you want to bet. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yes, maybe. Yeah. I did it innocently, as innocent as I ever get, so. I would go farther with, you know, with that idea. So I just wanted to go back and um, just wanted to clarify my comment uh, about your work uh, versus the usual fuzziness of, <laughs> yes. of the human condition or the human psychological condition is we do things we don't know why or we feel uh, certain ways about things we don't know why or perhaps where it comes from or what we can actually do with it. And I was mentioning that because I feel with your work there's very um, there's very little ambiguity. You're very clear and uh, I feel methodical uh, in your I guess research application to the subject matter you're you're working with at the time. Um, so it just it's a sort of a wonderful communication method that is of course very scientific. Uh, it, it feels to me. And the sort of uh, empirical scientific sort of tone you have to the approach uh, of a lot of subject matter, we could uh, refer back to some of your early medical science research, where I, I understand that you were involved in a very um, pioneering medical imaging project. And perhaps I think you were the, the first artist to be credited in a... Uh, the medical science journal for for your work can you tell us a little bit about that i'm not sure what you're referring to exactly there the embryonic <laughs> um, the embryology, uh, the the embryology the genital? yeah the general embryology uh, well there's really chris there's there's three let's call them tropes to use the intellectual term three basic tropes that i have followed over a lifetime i've been my first exhibition solo show, I was 14 years old, so I've been exhibiting for 61 years. 61 years. Yeah, that's, it's an appalling <laughs> thought, but it's true. You know, like, <clears throat> so when it comes to doing my CV, they want three pages, and I've got to cut out the last 16 pages to, <laughs> to do it, you know. The, the three basic ideas are, I have done projects where I'm an artist as part of a team of medical researchers. The second one is, I look at what I have done and published, therefore, in a scientific context, work done in those teams, and it's about the art of producing science as an artist. And the most recent, what these pieces are about, well, your term fuzziness is actually quite accurate, is I'm looking at the most subjective, internal, personal, uh, honest response visually to the same kind of basic material only as it affects my body. So as, you know, as a fragile human body, I'm interested in how my thinking as an artist inside myself can be represented graphically to share with other people. So to go back to the beginning, uh, I've been always interested since I was very young in medical and scientific content. But my basic way of communicating, even as a child, really was drawing. I mean, I failed school because I couldn't read, and that was, well, I won't get into why, but that's, it turns out there's reasons for that. Mm -hmm. I couldn't read and I couldn't write until I was about eight years old. In the meantime, I had developed the ability to draw profusely and everyone recognized that and supported that. I got praise for that all the time. And I learned how to talk. And I have always been able to talk and draw. That's my way of dealing with the world. So my first actual medical work, serious medical work, I was about 16 and I did a project in high school raising chicken eggs, chick eggs, uh, my girlfriend uh, was very interested in this project as well. She was a writer. And I would draw 
we opened an egg, we kept in an incubator for tw 21 days, opened an egg and draw what I saw, and she would write descriptions of what she saw. Her father was chief of staff and head of pathology in a huge Pittsburgh hospital. He was very impressed with what we were doing. Mm -hmm. We got the first science fair prize that year, you know, at the kids sort of thing. And it sort of put me on the path to thinking I could actually do art science, science art crossed over back and forth. Or put it this way, I could have scientific content, but my way of thinking was by drawing. And that's been the story of my life, really. Uh, he then brought me into the autopsy rooms to do a set of drawings of the hearts of blue babies, babies that are born that hearts don't function. So I was witness to autopsying babies. I near died at that age, but I learned how to deal in that kind of context. And he used these drawings in his lectures on this topic. So I was actually being published as a 16-year-old doing drawings in autopsy. Because he had the influence, then I worked as a surgical technician all the way through university to pay my way through university. So I had operating room experience every day and was constantly in contact with medical research kind of content and access to the laboratory techniques that allow me to do it under his guidance. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I thought I was in love with his daughter, but I think I was in love with him. He was a <laughs> fantastic mentor, friend, and support, and he valued what I could do. So it, so it really it started there. The project you're referring to was many years later, uh, after I realized I, I got to the point where it was time to go to university, I had a, a scholarship to Temple University in Philadelphia in medicine, or well, pre-med, really, you know, not about medicine yet at that stage. And I had a scholarship to Carnegie Institute of Technology in visual art, and in my mind there was no question about this. I took the art route. So that was the end of medicine then for me, for an extended period of time. But I always wanted to do something more with that kind of content. So many years later, after teaching at Carnegie Mellon University and teaching in Scotland and um, working as a visual artist and using techniques that are very scientific in their approach. I can come back to that. It's referred to in art theory, you know, as indexical images, where the image on the, in this case, like, say, a lithographic plate, was the direct transfer of ink from the surface of a woman's body. And a footprint in the sand is an index with which we recognize what's going on. So this way of thinking of making images, the most scientific way I could come up with, was always in my work, even when I wasn't doing stuff published in science. So after how many years in the Arctic was when we did this? After seven years in the Arctic, uh, I came out, we had a second child. I had to quit working in the Arctic. I had to get some kind of a job. I was invited to a dinner party by a member of the Manitoba Arts Council who owned work of mine. Her husband was a urological surgeon and at the dinner table, making conversation with this artist, just to be nice, he said that he had seen clay models of surgical techniques when he was a student at Shaftesbury Hospital in London, in England. Have I ever knew of anyone who'd like to try something like that? <laughs> I mean, honestly, Chris, this is how it worked. I felt like in medieval illustration, God's finger pointed through the ceiling. <laughs> said, Jack, you're on. <laughs> I said, oh, knock, knock, Alan. Knock. <laughs> yeah. I started the next morning and ended up working for numerous, quite a few years, modeling the development of the human genitals in the embryo. I thought I would go to Gray's Anatomy or something and see what this looked like and do a clay model that suit his research and his filmmaking. But there so was on. none, was there? There was none. The only thing in Gray's Anatomy, he said, oh no, that's totally inaccurate. That's called a hypospadias. It's totally misnamed. We don't have these images. The only thing we have are wax models and they're based on pigs. Pig anatomy is closer to us in embryology than any other critter. But it's still not us. <laughs> it's still not. Well, no, no it's still not us. <laughs> Some people maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so he wanted me to then start from scratch. Well, where would I get access to this? So I became part of a team made up of the urological surgeon, the endocrinologist, which is the real study of how the body does its manufacturing of sexual difference, for instance, ethicist. Uh, I spent four years building models from specimen that were in laboratories by working with a dissecting microscope when there were abortuses you know, for totally other reasons, but I was first in line to make a drawing of what I saw before that they then went on for use within the hospital system, 
It was a highly critical area. It eventually was stopped by religious influences in the hospital in Winnipeg, and we couldn't do that anymore. Religious influences stopped the medical imaging? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, uh, of abortuses. And there's all kinds of ethical things. I mean, it's ethically very implicated. It's complicated. So I, I lost access to the original source. I finally produced, what I produced was one clay model, large enough to be modeled by hand, which I then put through its changes, like a human change would be, photographing it at each stage. So I came up with 12 stages in the development of the genitals, including what were considered abnormalities and malformations, which since have been described as intersex. So I, I've continued to work on that project until now, off and on, in different guises and in different ways. But the key thing was, I was working with a team of people, publishing science, but using my artistic abilities as the way to get to the publishable science. And I depended on the protection of that team to know what I was doing and whether it was right or wrong, literally in terms of ethics, and useful scientifically or not. That they made those decisions. From that then, over the years, the, the, the second really big project I did was the development of how the human lungs, how the human lungs develop the capacity to breathe. It's called the development of the terminal acinus. An acinus is like a little sinus or pouch. It's literally the development of the lungs, which start off as three little tree branches in the embryo that end up with millions of these articulated breathing chambers, even at the, even the embryo at, at, the, at birth. So I was provided with cross sections of stained slides of different stages in the embryological development of the lungs and asked, could I please make a three-dimensional model to show what this would actually look like as a three-dimensional structure in space? Well, it, you know, it's an ideal puzzle-solving kind of project for an artist. Mm -hmm. And looking at that, I kept thinking, why do these look so familiar to me? What have I seen that looks like this? And I eventually came up with uh, surfaces under tension. So I worked both mathematically, and I worked visually, and I worked art historically. My photographs of ice forming on Baker Lake in the Arctic looked exactly like cross-sections at certain stages of the development of the lungs. Now here I'm standing on a frozen lake with ridges created by the way the ice has formed. The ridges are catching the snow. I have these beautiful black and white photographs. I show them to the pediatric risk virologist who works with this, and he says, are these structures you already built to look like the lungs? And I said, no, no, this is photographs of ice. You know. Does this... Um would, would you say this is, am I, I'm creating a connection in my mind to fractal theory, it, sort of the, the yeah. patterns that recur on sort of the meta and micro scales and nature all around yeah, us. This would be the question you finally boiled down to, what would be the mathematics, what would be the actual three-dimensional structure of one element or chamber of the fractal that would then go fractal, as it were, and produce itself at, at, at differing scales forever? The lungs are like that in some ways, in some ways not. The ideal breathing chamber, called an alveolus, what would that actually be like? How would they fit together? How would they produce this three-dimensional model? So I mean, it was a matter of building in clay examples of what this tree branching looked like. It turns out that, that um, um, I can't think of the term right now, the simplest mathematical structures that repeat endlessly with no wasted space became the source of what I was looking for. And I began to discover, like for instance, used in Islamic art, like the tiling of the Alhambra is a perfect example of what the lungs look like and they develop in the embryo. So I brought all these kind of sources together uh, and came up with three-dimensional physical structure, which I built because there's the organic tree branching development in the body and yet there's the geometric, like you're suggesting, fractals, the geometric structure for what would be turned out to be like the ideal, the ideal one of these chambers. They all may vary somewhat, but there's an ideal that they're all striving toward. And it turns out it's a 14-faceted, truncated, tetrahedral structure that I then built and showed how they produced the lungs. And so I published the models. I published the sections. I, I literally built it in plasticine clay at, at a stage that represented the ideal terminal acinus, with about six branches intersecting, coated it with dental acrylic, which represented the walls of the lungs, cut it in half so you could see it in section, and took the clay out, which would be the air. So what you're left with is the structure supporting the air, which is what the lung is really all about. Mm -hmm. 
and that was then published as... Now, <laughs> I suspect you did not have religious groups protesting against your exploration of the lungs. No. They probably didn't understand what they were looking at, perhaps. No. I, I will say that it was interesting, because when I was looking at that, that movie you have on your website, with the, uh, just to go back to the... Yeah, which the embryotic, movie? The embryotic... Uh, oh, oh, yeah, it's development. called Genital Embryogenesis, yeah. Thank you, yeah. Um, and I, was, I had this up on the screen, and then my partner walks in, and like, just a, a, who's a very enlightened Person. individual <laughs> and, and, a, and, and a proud atheist, but yeah. still had a very immediate emotional reaction. What to was what, her emotional reaction? She's like, well, what is, what is this? Exactly. And yeah. I, I, I said, well, what does it look like? Yeah. And she goes, uh, you know, I don't think I like this very much. She just assumed it was an, an artwork I was looking at, which is correct, but she assumed it was uh, in her mind, I guess, it was just some perverted artist using this as an excuse to mm -hmm. to explore this this imagery and and uh, yeah the work that I did on the lungs was free of all that. Of on the other hand, I had no access to specimen. I had stained slides provided by the laboratory. The work that I did on the developing heart, which was the next really big project, had none of those problems either. But they were technically harder and harder to do. The trouble with the genitals is it's such a simple structure. And the image that I finally produced in genital development was the classic image of that moment when mm -hmm. the genital is neither male nor female. The body is not able to articulate that difference in its physical structure yet, even though every cell of the body knows what it's going to be. And I was able to show what that actually looks like. Well, no one, I discovered, including me, can look at that without having an opinion about what it is. We immediately, because of the way our culture works, you have to go back and... and, and um, I don't get that age, I can't think of anything until the next day, and read, you know, the, the history of sexuality that, that, you know, that, that gives you an understanding of why, as a culture, this is the first way we parse for power. Is it a boy or a girl? This is totally irrelevant in the history of human beings, but it's how we organize our society. It's so a hot topic right it's now. Been, it has yeah. been forever. You know, and it, you know, it's brilliantly analyzed in the 20th century and still continues with this now. But to make an image that's scientifically accurate for what that structure would be like, no one looking at it cannot respond with the cultural baggage. And I, first time I tried, to, well, what happened was 10 years later, I decided I wanted to make an animation to animate these still, these still models, starting because I was learning how to do a computer. And I had... Um, animation program, very simple thing in Macromind Director. And I had the still photographs, and I thought, I can, I can scan these, and animate these, and let them dissolve, and show how this process looks. And I can even add text to my own semi-scientific, semi-artistic language. That's how I produced that animation. And I still to this day show that in the context of the larger piece called Fake Maps, Would You Like to Know What Will Happen? So th these projects have been layered, complicated, they involve science in all kinds of ways, and not science in all kinds of ways, but they're always fundamentally motivated by my understanding of things as an artist, my own particular way of seeing things. Well, and, and that's uh, something else I was going to comment on that um, I think I noticed about your, your work, um, is your career seems to have gone um, in the opposite a lot of ways to what a lot of the movements, popular movements were, which was essentially a lot of art about art, yeah. art about the experience of making art. Yeah. Um, you know, what is art? What is not art? You know, that's the whole 20th century, yeah, starting right. with Duchamp. Is it art or not? That's the whole 20th century is about whether it's art or not. <laughs> in, in, in a way, your your work, and and maybe this is just another cultural myth that's in the back of my mind. But in, in a way, it, it seems to it seems to be a very older approach of, of marrying art and science and philosophy uh, in a very uh, uh, you know, deliberate, deliberate and rigorous uh, mm -hmm. projects. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this goes back to you know days when people were, there was a very little difference between being a scientist and being an artist and being a writer. This, this was all one big ball of wax. And, and then now you're... 17th century. Yeah. Height, height of about the 16th century with like Leonardo and so on. And a lot of, a lot of good things were were figured out. A lot of bad things were figured out. A lot of good things were figured out because of this this synergy. Yeah. And 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 of course in, in my age in, in particular, um, 
you know, you had to specialize the hell out of whatever it is you claim to know about. Uh, or else you just weren't. So if you were an artist, you had to know all about art. But if you were going into other stuff like engineering or, or anthropology or something like that, well, then you're, you're diluting your, your, your status, you're diluting your, your expertise. Yeah. Yeah, you're quite right. So I, especially early on, I couldn't get science grants because it was art. I couldn't get art grants because it obviously wasn't art, it was science, it's that science should be supporting it. So I cast my lot with art always, and I did quite well grant-wise. These big projects pay very, very little, but the privilege of being able to work in an area where I have special interest and special expertise, like it's me. And in Winnipeg, I, you know, very few medical artists trained to be medical artists would ever get to do what I did every day. And because in Winnipeg I was recognized as an artist with major exhibitions, and a career that the people in medicine could see the advantage of using this. If I had been in Toronto, I never would have had access to this material, ever. Right, yeah. I had to be in a provincial center. <laughs> Forgive me, Winnipeg, I love Winnipeg. You know? <laughs> For people to say, you know, like Ellen Dechter, the neurological surgeon, saying, well, let's try that tomorrow morning. Are you really interested? You know, because they owned work of mine that was on the wall, that had major grants, I was already, you know, a, a feature person in Winnipeg as an artist, so I had that, that I had one level of credibility. <laughs> and then when he saw what I could do, like in terms of medical content, I mean, I fit into these groups. And I paid my way through art school as a surgical technician. He was worried about my going into surgery to watch him do surgical things, and the whole place was up in arms. And he said, well, he would keep an eye on me. So I scrubbed and went into surgery within minutes. Two people totally forgot that I was there. I mean, I was trained in that from childhood. You know, I knew how to do the operating room. And it was not long after that that they let artists vote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't think they let artists vote still. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> so. That's not a good idea, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's um, your abilities to operate within this more expansive realm of practice, being an artist and, and mm -hmm. with a... Mm -hmm. Um, a knowledge and interest in practice and practice in medical um, research mm -hmm. through imaging. Um, there was one line on your website that seemed to me to sort of help describe that. And so you use sensual, sensuous tools of picturing. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to me you're, you're not afraid to use <laughs> emotion essentially as a texture for understanding objects or, or patterns in the world around you, uh, which is, I mean, after I just said it, uh, obviously not many people would, would do that or would occur to them to, to do that, but um, the sort of the, the, the brave uh, and this very innovative and uh, uh, admire it very much how you're able to um, use this as a vehicle, the, the human psyche as a vehicle to understanding um, the human physicality, the human mm -hmm. structure, and and not um, necessarily tying them together, but showing that there is that they're the same thing. Uh, often, what we're separating are, that's very nice <laughs> is, is not separate. Your paraphrase is excellent. <laughs> oh, no. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, it's it's not separate. It's <laughs> it's just another facet. Our 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 mind constructs our our physicality and our relationship to the mm -hmm. to the physical world. And it seems right in that little area there where that little electric connection's happening <laughs> yeah. is, is, where, uh, is, is where your work is, mm -hmm. is, is primarily based. Is, would you say that's... Yeah, no, no I think that you, I'm serious. Your paraphrase is excellent. Now, one of the key words there, it's more loaded than you may be aware, is picturing. Um, there is, is a movement in philosophy of science to deal with picturing as knowledge and to go back that to look at the whole history of, of, of how pictures have been used, it's always been considered to sort of illustrate what is, uh, what is independent other knowledge, rather than the knowledge in fact exists in the pictures, and that's how we have access to it. And therefore we have access through those limitations and strengths that art provides, rather than what scientifically, which is usually word-based, or the main, the main language, for science is mathematics. I mean, it's, science is able to, to speak primarily in mathematical terms. 
but what about the whole history of, of, of pictures? And it, therein, is a separate vocabulary. It's, the art part of it requires knowledge in the same degree that it would as if you were dealing with mathematics. And I'm interested in where, where they overlap. So in my doing the degree in philosophy of science, I did everything I could to deal with issues where picturing was part of the issue, and it became a, a key term even in contemporary science to look at the pictures as the the residents of the the meaningful content, not just as illustrations that can be accessed in a very variety of other ways, but the real meaning is contained there. It's certainly true in something like anatomy, for instance, when you look at the history of or almost anything dealing with the human body, and as we move more and more closely to uh, a preoccupation with the human body as our biggest mystery in the 21st century, I mean, the, the issues of consciousness, for instance, and how that relates to embodiment, and how that relates to difference, have become the thrust of the 21st century. And the pictures are a way, one way, to gain access you know, to this. So I, I'm very much interested then, as an artist making pictures, that's why the second trip I was talking about is I make work that looks at how I, as an artist, engage with scientific content. The art part is the focus. The scientific content helps articulate and ground and relate and connect to the rest of the world. But it's the art of it that I'm really focusing on. That's why, like, fake maps, which you'd like to know what will happen, takes terms from embryology and reifies them physically so that you experience them. You know, you get to do what I did. My way of thinking has been brought into the world in a series of etched glass panels through which you watch a video projection of the base imagery that gave me the structure that I used to develop the, the mathematical structure for the developing alveolus, the breathing chambers of the lung. So the piece is about the process of getting to the knowledge. You see, this is what I'm talking about. I, when I try to talk about my work, uh, I feel more confused afterwards, and the person I'm talking to feels more confused. <laughs> but talking to you, it becomes so clear, so logical. Does that so, sound clear? So deliberate, yes. It's it, so hard to do. I mean, I, I don't know. It, it, it always sounds confusing to me afterward, too, Chris, so don't, don't feel bad. Okay. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's, it, the effort, however, to try to talk about it is very interesting to me. You know, I, I mean, I look at what I'm doing and thinking, I'm going to apply for another grant. <laughs> you know, what, what am I actually doing here? How can I tell somebody else what I'm doing? And part of art making is it comes from the nervous system, it comes from the body, it doesn't arrive as a textual description. <laughs> it's a happening in the world, and you look at it and think, this is quite believable to me, this is a marvelous thing, I love this thing. What did I do? How can I tell somebody what I did here? I could be like Picasso at the turn of the 20th century and say, don't talk to the driver. <laughs> That's a quote. It's brilliant. I don't think that way or feel that way. You know, I want you to talk to the driver. The driver's trying to figure out where the hell we're going. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, Jack. Uh, just to, just to start to finish uh, wrapping up this interview, I, it, it occurs to me you you would have made a really great supervillain. With you know, with, <laughs> and I want to thank you on, on behalf of humanity for for going the route of knowledge and light. And so why did you think of that? <laughs> Because you have such a, a keen observational uh, intellect <laughs> and, and, and powers of construction and, uh, and everything else. And, and uh, uh, you know, it, it just it was occurred to me as a funny thought that uh, you're, you know, um, it's, I guess going back to like those, those, you know, very powerful men in the 17th century who were scientists and artists and, and uh, um, innovators that, uh, you know, you, you could have been, uh, you know, use your powers to, uh, I, don't, I don't know, make a... <laughs> <laughs> I make pictures. <laughs> it's pretty innocent, actually, at the end of the day. It's not so innocent, is it? You had trouble with, with groups of people who did not yeah, like... It's not so innocent. As your partner noticed when she took one glance at the screen, what is that? <laughs> what is that? And I would suggest, you know, reading all of Foucault on the history of sexuality to understand why that innocent little devilly thing is such a threat to the world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Honest to God, it's a very simple structure, actually. Uh, yeah, people, uh, soul civilizations are very concerned with what's between our legs. That's for sure. Uh, and, uh, and also with what's between our eyes. <laughs> was, was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes very little. Or behind our eyes, I guess it would be. My um, nose is between our eyes. <laughs> Jack, um... I could go on all day, as you realize, so it's time to... 
I think I think we will have to go on again uh, because we haven't covered enough oh. um, of your your vast experience. Um, so Jack Butler, thank you very much. Oh, you're very for taking welcome. the time Chris, to uh, Chris Healy. <laughs> to, well, I'm going to say us because that's what people seem to do in these interviews. Thanks for talking to us.